Hey everyone, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. We're going back to hockey, back back to the ice. So I'm excited about this one. Um, we finished the book uh, yesterday that the today's chat is um, based around. So it was really, really good. I enjoyed it. It was a very gripping book, gripping story, uh, and has lots of things I like as you guys have started to learn. Um, hockey and, and military history. So it's it's a good it's a good combo. Uh, so I'm excited to have uh, today's guest on who wrote the book. Uh, and uh, Dave Gripstad is he's I'll let him just introduce himself. He's got a lot going on. <laughs> I can't remember it all, so we'll let him do a quick intro. But uh, very, very impressive fellow, as what I can say. Uh, but so I'm excited, and like I said, the story has got like I put on Twitter earlier today. It's got losses and victories and all that. It's it's kind of a gripping tale that took place just uh, over a hundred years ago now. So I'm excited to get this one going. Hey Dave, thanks for coming on today. Well, thanks very much for having me, and thank you very much for the kind words introducing me there. That uh, made me tear up a little bit. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, I was I do that because I check everybody. Like I try to do a quick little thing. You have too much going on. I couldn't remember it all. <laughs> you do too much in a good way. Uh, so I was having trouble being like I can't pick a point. Maybe just let him uh, talk about your background. So if you could, that would be great. Um, just to start off, share with what you want, and uh, we can uh, go from there. Uh, sure. Uh, okay. Um, well, my name is Dave Grebstead, as you already said. Uh, my I am a colonel in the Canadian Army right now. Uh, and uh, like you, I live in Ottawa, uh, which is uh, most colonels find their way to Ottawa and, uh, and, and, <laughs> and sometimes never leave. So I work at National Defense Headquarters, uh, which uh, if, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, that we have two campuses and I'm at the downtown campus because I'm uh, the director of peacekeeping policy in the uh, in the policy group. So I'm working mostly with civilians actually and just kind of uh, uh, interacting with our foreign affairs department to make sure that our, uh, uh, our, our defense policy is in sync with our global foreign policy. Hmm. So um, yeah, I'm originally, originally from uh, Dryden, Ontario. Uh, so, you know, if, if nobody knows where that is, that's okay. It's a beautiful, tiny little town in uh, the Northwest of Ontario. Uh, if uh, it's situated almost exactly halfway between uh, Thunder Bay and Winnipeg, mm -hmm. uh, along the uh, uh, both the CPR line and the, and the Trans Canada Highway, and for the hockey fans out there, if you if you want to know uh, any, anything interesting about Dryden, it's the hometown of uh, Chris Pronger. So uh, most people, if you're a hockey fan, you probably remember the six foot six uh, defenseman who played for St. Louis, and, uh, and well, I think he's most he's well best known for St. Louis. He just they just retired his jersey. Uh, as, as a youngster, I, I played hockey with him. Well, I say that he played hockey. I kind of fell on the ice, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. he he was he was two he's two years younger than me. Uh, and he actually went off. Uh, he was always in my league though because he was so good. Uh, mm. And then, you know, sometime around, I think it was junior high or high school, we just never saw him again because he was already getting scouted and moving yeah. along. So uh, I'm not sure when he talks, if he says, uh, you know, I'm from Dryden, you, you know, where Dave Grebstead's from. I doubt he does, <laughs> but uh, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> you never know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, so I uh, grew up in Dryden, uh, went off to school, in, and as you can tell, I'm a big fan of Winnipeg. Uh, which uh, well, a little later we can talk about why I why I wrote the book. But uh, mm -hmm. I went off to university at the uh, University of Manitoba and got my bachelor's there. Uh, and uh, at about the same time, I joined the Army Reserve. Uh, so I spent uh, in, in northwestern Ontario as well. Uh, spent uh, I managed to squeeze a four year degree into five years at the University of Manitoba. Uh, then worked at a number of uh, uh, I guess less than uh, less than exciting jobs afterwards as I try, pondered my career choices and eventually I decided well I need to uh, I need to have a career so I transferred to the regular force of the army uh, and lo and behold my first posting was uh, in Shiloh Manitoba which is <laughs> the uh, yeah in Shiloh Manitoba I spent five years there and you know everybody everybody you know tends to cringe when they hear the, the word Shiloh and for anybody here who's listening who doesn't know where Shiloh is it's it's in it's tucked away in the uh, in the west of uh, of Manitoba, and uh, <laughs> a, the best way the best way it was described to me is that y it's not the end of the earth, uh, but you can see the end of the earth from the back of the officers' mess. <laughs> and uh, so, but but nonetheless, it's I actually thoroughly enjoyed it. Didn't mm, necessarily good. enjoy the winters, uh, 
Well, uh, but I, yeah, I met my uh, I met my wife there, so I'll always have fond memories of Shiloh. Uh, literally in the gym, in the base gym, in uh, in Shiloh. So, and uh, we're still going strong, seventeen plus years later. Uh, okay. And yeah, and uh, so uh, so all has to say that I spent a lot of time in Manitoba uh, and developed a uh, a real affinity for the city city of Winnipeg. I go back and visit his office I can, but you know, due to COVID, it's not as not as often as I, as I would like. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really kind of informed. I'd, I'd love to go back. Uh, I've, I've pitched to my wife a couple of times that we should retire in Winnipeg and she never really picks up on that. And, uh, she kind of, <laughs> she kind of says, Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, <laughs> never, never says no outright, but she never really warmly embraces the idea mm. either. Uh, but so I'm hoping, mm-hmm. sadly, you know, due to my trade and my, and my, and my rank now, there, there are no actual positions. Uh, well, there's one in position in Winnipeg for an army colonel and maybe I could slide into that sometime in the future. But, uh, uh, up to this point, the queen hasn't uh, felt it, uh, an appropriate use of my talents. So, mm-hmm. uh, so that's me in a nutshell, uh, big hockey fan, uh, like you actually, when we were talking earlier, I didn't mention this, but I was a, I was a diehard Montreal Canadiens fan. Uh, right up until 2011, when the Winnipeg Jets came back, and mm. I said, "No, you know, I know I owe it to my uh, the town that I've kind of fallen in love with, and, and I was so happy that a Canadian team that had been uh, that had been lost it came came back to Winnipeg." Okay. I said, "I got to yeah. switch my allegiance." So it was hard, and I still have a very warm spot in my heart for the Montreal Canadiens, uh, but I am a very much a Winnipeg Jets fan. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I was yeah. I was at well, I was at course, the very course. last game. Uh, in uh, in the Winnipeg Jets, the original Winnipeg Arena, when they lost to Detroit in the playoffs in 1997. So, and I saw them skate off for the last time. So that always kind of stuck in my memory too. Well, that would do it. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. as others have said, I am a French Canadian descent, and as others have put it, uh, you're just born into it, and you don't have a choice. <laughs> <with Yeah. the laughs> Canadian. It's just the way it is, um, mm-hmm. especially as the only team left. So in Quebec, so <laughs> it is what it is, and I just embraced it when I was a bit younger. So it is what it is. But I, I love my team. That's never going to change, and I'm never going to cheer for any other team. So <laughs> that's just the way it is. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, to begin. Um, we have a PowerPoint, which is great. So I can bring that up, mm-hmm. but it, it kind of, you kind of laid out my question for me, which is always okay. kind of nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why? <laughs> like, I mean, uh, uh, for those who don't, well, I guess I can let you explain it, Dave, but it's, 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 it's obviously a story. I think that's fairly well known. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe we can talk about that later, but cause like I posted earlier today, there is a heritage minute about it for us Canadians. Those are big deals like that. We have these, mm-hmm. that we're all over TV when I was a kid, like that you couldn't miss them. Um, so I think fairly people are fairly well know about them, but kind of why this story, like in a country full of hockey stories and even connections to other parts of history, why why this team in particular? Uh, well, you, you know, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, I've already kind of expressed this kind of almost weird affinity I have for the city of Winnipeg. And when I first heard about this story, it, you know, it, 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 it resonates with every, everybody in Winnipeg knows about it because it, it's right. one of those facts you put, just like Winnie the Pooh is named after the city of Winnipeg. Yeah. It's, right. uh, you know, hey, the Winnipeg Falcons won the first ever uh, Olympic gold medal uh, in ice hockey. And so, and so it's something to, uh, uh, it's something to kind of hang your head on and, for, and to have some civic pride in. Uh, but, you know, as I kind of went through my career and I, I, I got my bachelor's in history in uh, – um, at the University of Manitoba, and later my Master of Arts in History at University of New Brunswick, and I became a real kind of amateur history buff. And I, I read more. I, I realized, and for those who don't know, the uh, uh, you know the name of my book is A Confluence of Destinies, and I called it that because right. the uh, the the number of things that had to go right for the Winnipeg mm-hmm. Falcons to actually win the gold medal. Uh, you know, there's just so many. The the number, you know, it the, the number of destinies, the number of uh, decisions that had to be made that they had no control over. Uh, though it, it absolutely mm. fascinates me that everything lined up for them, uh, and that's not to diminish what what they did. You know, in the end, they had to win all the games. They had to have the skill, uh, and yep. they had to get over there and actually and, and attend the Olympics. Uh, but just to give you an idea, you know, they. they 
there was a there was at turn of the century or early early 20th century uh, in Winnipeg was there was a great great deal of class uh, class tension uh, and racial tension uh, within the city. Uh, and and it's no it's no secret that uh, this team, which was predominantly uh, kids of Icelandic descent, um, were uh, you know were, were discriminated against to a degree. Uh, and right. and yet you know, even when after the war, uh, it, it didn't even look like the, they were going to be uh, allowed to join the Manitoba Senior mm-hmm. Hockey uh, uh, League because you know there were there was they were invested or there were there were like hockey leadership that wanted to focus on what they called the big three, which were uh, the, the three city teams. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's just one example uh, of something they had to overcome. But, you know, if, if, and probably a lot of people here aren't, aren't, uh, aren't familiar with the history of the Icelanders in Canada, mm. uh, you, you know, so very, very briefly in, in the late 1800s, uh, uh, 1870s, uh, a small colony came and settled in the Muskoka region uh, and, uh, and about half of them went off to Wisconsin. The others kind of stayed in the Muskoka region of Ontario. If, if, if people aren't familiar with that, it's just kind of north of Toronto, uh, just by a few hundred kilometers. And, uh, and they, they, weren't, they weren't very successful. So, you know, eventually they started looking for other options and, and more immigrants from Iceland were, were coming. Uh, and uh, uh, so with the help of no less than the governor general at the time, uh, they, they found a colony or they found a... A potential uh, uh, a colony site in Manitoba, in what's called the Interlake area, which is the the kind of the the the, uh, the the strip of land in between Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba, and and they eventually everybody agreed that they could move there. So they traveled up there, brought all their belongings uh, uh, by rail to Winnipeg, then you know li- literally floated down the river and uh, towed by a Hudson Bay tug on flat boats to what is now near net what is now Gimli. In Manitoba and and set themselves up there uh, and and they thrived uh, I, I guess kind of culturally uh, but had a heck of a time uh, and there was a smallpox outbreak in 1876 that really hit hit the colony bad uh, there was even a, a less a less bad but still uh, interesting outbreak of leprosy amongst the uh, <laughs> the, the nice land yeah. of, sorry just to about jump 10 in years there. later yeah. That was very strange to read that. Mm-hmm. You, the, I don't want to give away too much of your book because, again, I, I, I for everyone watching, because well, Dave's not going to say this outright. I'll just say it for him. Go buy the book; it's online. You can get it. I think it's through it's through Amazon, right? It um, is indeed. Yeah. Yeah, for both Canada and U.S. as far as I could see. Um, so just mm-hmm. go get it. <laughs> but that said, like the, the, that's what it is. Like um, me and Dave were talking about this, and why I really like this book and appreciate it is it's yes, it's a story about a hockey team who had that's made up of first world war veterans but there's so much more here and as dave's talking about with the icelandic connections like some of you are learning that live in wisconsin you know that have can you know know these some of the descendants of these people right it's it, it's really interesting to learn all these different things it's it's very cool so um mm. uh, anyway sorry yeah the leprosy thing that was not what i was expecting you know you don't hear you know late 19th <laughs> century you expect i don't know like measles or something like that but not leprosy yeah, yeah. that was very strange yeah 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 it, it, exactly and i remember you know our research uh resources now the, the number of things you can uh like i was on i think it was archive.org and i kind of did just a search for icelandic manitoba and i got this western canada lancet article from you know the uh, the late oh, 19th yeah. century and it was talking about this leprosy outbreak in the icelandic community yet and it's uh, but yeah it, it happened yeah i think in the end there were three or four cases so i don't want to say outbreak and make it think that yeah there well, was, it was one, a leper one is too many but you know yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh but but yeah so that just gives you an idea of the, the stock the these hockey players were from that they had to overcome yeah. all of these challenges as well uh and i mean they were eking out an existence on the prairies of, of manitoba uh and uh, eventually many of them moved to the city and um yeah. Uh, and they uh, uh, and they developed a, a, a pretty tight knit community uh, within within Winnipeg themselves. But then you know faced the discrimination. But the other bit was uh, you know almost, as we mentioned, almost all of them that eventually went on to win the gold medal fought in the First World War. And I know we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail. Yeah. Uh, but and and 
we'll, we'll talk about the two that were lost. And if you've seen the Heritage Minute, they, they, they really focus on that too. Uh, and uh, you know, so th- th- there was no guarantee that any, any of them were going to come back, uh, but, they, uh, but they did. Uh, and then, of course, you know, in, in, in the, the, the lost generation of, of post-war, uh, uh, of, of the, the years that immediately following the post-war, the racial and class strife that led to the Winnipeg general strike, yeah. uh, the, the Spanish flu, all of these things, uh, you know, and didn't just affect them, but it was never even for certain there was going to be an Olympics in 1920 in Antwerp. <laughs> Right. Uh, and, yeah. and uh, you know, it was it was kind of a last minute decision. And even then it was kind of a, uh, you know, a, a weird, not a weird decision, but somebody at the last minute say, hey, why don't we add hockey and, and figure skating? <laughs> and yeah. uh, they said, all right, why not? We'll throw it in there, too. So, yeah, uh, weird. so you know, all this lined up and 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 these these boys, uh, you know, who were not written off at the start of the uh, at the start of the season because they were a talented hockey team but they mm. certainly weren't encouraged but they overcame all of this everything lined up for them uh, and I thought what an amazing story and you know I referred earlier I, I have this is a slimmed down version at one point I uh, <laughs> I had a much larger version that that described battles in detail and and yeah. went into great detail about the uh, the Paris Peace Conference and mm. c- to kind of describe all these things that were were yep. moving around in, in the environment and I thought, well, I, th- I think maybe I should uh, focus a little bit more. But, but <laughs> hey, anyway, we've so, all been there. Yeah. Anyone who's written a book length project, yeah. <laughs> I like. I, I'm sorry, just to jump in, but I literally yeah. did almost the same thing with my dissertation. Yeah. I got too. I got so many comments being like, "You're talking about the First World War too much." And I went, "All right, fine, I'll take it out." But I was just yeah. like writing about it, so I couldn't stop myself. But yeah, it's uh, that happens. That's a that's yeah. a that's a yeah. pitfall of the trade, I suppose. It is uh, there. I, I served in Egypt for a year as a peacekeeper, and uh, I, had, I I worked for an Australian general, and he was very fond of one saying. And when we this is when we were talking about staff work, and he mm. he, he always quoted a, a a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. Not sure if he actually said it, but Mark Twain apparently once wrote, and I, I would have uh, I would have written you a, a a shorter letter if I'd had more time. Uh, yeah. And it just kind of reflects the uh, yeah. how hard it is to edit and you know yeah. and to choose what you want to leave in and, and take out. Yeah. Yep. But but in in about five thousand words, that's why I, uh, I I wanted to write about the, the story of the Falcons. What, well, one I, thing I, I'll also add sorry, here. Ahead, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, oh, no I should have mentioned off the hop. Uh, you know, uh, the story is getting more well known, and, and another not just writing the book, but another initiative I undertook and. and you know, this is good news for everybody who wants to do something like this. If you think an event is important enough, there is a process by which you can recommend to the government of Canada that they recognize an event as an event of national historical significance. Right. So in about 2018, uh, 2017 or so, I said, you know what, I think this is significant enough to be an event of national historical significance. Uh, So I wrote the letter and it, working in the federal government as I do, I know nothing goes quickly. Uh, And, and, (laughs) About yeah. two and a half years later, after much back and forth, uh, the government uh, decided that uh, that the, the Winnipeg Falcons would be disc- uh, 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 named as an event of national historical yeah. significance for Canada. So, so that was good news too. Mm-hmm. Two and a half—that sounds actually fast. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I was like, that sounds like uh, that's breakneck speed for the federal it, government. For it was pre-COVID too, so maybe that's oh, why. It's, oh yeah. yeah, maybe I don't know. That just seems mm-hmm. faster than everything I've ever dealt with them. But uh, mm-hmm. no hate. Just that's <laughs> the way the federal government works, uh, especially uh, in right. this time and these in these times. Uh, anyway, yeah. So what I was gonna say is. Like I said earlier, it's it's it, I think the best way. It's about a hockey team. It's about the story of a hockey team. But there's more mm-hmm. going on here, right? And 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 I, and that's another thing I really appreciated in understanding this is I didn't. Re- I guess I didn't really know that much about the 1920s Olympics. I thought I did, mm-hmm. but I guess I didn't because just like you described it very well, and I'm not going to talk about it too much because I want people to go get the book and read it for themselves. It is that the process of itself of this Olympics and everything that's not just going on in Canada or even in Winnipeg where this team is coming from but the world literally having troubles like getting there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> having issues with all of that and what that means and like this is like the war is fresh like yeah it's 1920 mm-hmm. but it's it's fresh like this is still something that is very you know recent so uh, mm-hmm. and i think that could be a good segue to move forward and maybe talk a little bit uh, 
more about the the war service because again it, it's an interesting sure. part that you just often as someone again who's not you know from a prairie province or been to one to be honest it, mm -hmm. it, that you hear about the war you're like oh they served in the war right and but that's it right and they're like then they mm -hmm. won and they overcome because then teammates were killed and that's all you hear so i think it's mm -hmm. it is important to talk about you know the background that goes on here because it, it does it factors into the team so it's 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 quite important mm -hmm. for sure Uh, do we? Yeah, uh, we talked about this pretty briefly. Uh, the I, one thing we could talk about is the well. The one thing I did want to ask you about, and we talked about in the mm -hmm. book, is the the name. I I, I I got from what you read, but I was wondering if you could just explain that a little more. Is there more to the mythology of the falcon within Icelandic culture? Well, yeah, sadly, uh, I can't answer that. I know I know from my readings that there it does figure prominently in Icelandic culture. Uh, I, I don't know necessarily why. Uh, but but it is the okay. name they landed on. Yeah, and, it just uh, seems so sorry. seemingly random to be honest. Um, yeah, because there's other teams right that are in North America that have been called the yeah. Falcons for a long time, right? And there's no seemingly rhyme or reason. I played on a football mm. team that's called the Falcons. Couldn't tell you why. Yeah. <laughs> it was just the name. <laughs> but yeah, that's just what got the wheels turning. But it is it's connected to the uh, the Icelandic um, um, heritage and culture. So. Uh, yeah, so maybe, the, yeah, maybe the one, you want to talk about the team just before the war, and then we can go from there. Sure. Yeah, I won't go through the entire history of hockey in Manitoba, which in, is itself is fascinating. But oh, you yeah. know, by the eight, by the eighteen, it was introduced in the eighteen seventies. Uh, well, no, sorry, eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, I think, uh, and uh, and took off really, really quickly. Uh, but you know, in the climate in Winnipeg, that's that's not surprising at all mm -hmm. uh but but by the night in by the 90s uh, manitoba became a hockey superpower and we know the winnipeg victorias uh, uh yep. won the stanley cup in, in 19 sorry 1895 1896 i think in 1901 and 1902 uh and they they challenged for it a couple times in there as well uh so winnipeg you know very very quickly became this this kind of within canada anyway this uh hockey superpower uh and you know the, the Icelanders took to it, even though it was a predominantly Protestant, yeah. uh, Anglo-Protestant kind of pastime. Everybody yeah. kind of, every kind, everybody kind of glommed onto it and started playing. So, uh, you know, the Icelandic community was rather segregated. So they actually they had their own league, and they mm. had two teams: the uh, uh, the Icelandic Athletic Club and the Vikings. Who you know they would play each other and. and 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 the winner would get a trophy, and, and eventually I get, that probably just got boring. I would assume uh, and so. people, yeah, people grew out of it, so they decided let's just create one competitive team and see if we can play with everybody else. And that's uh, that started in the first decade of the twentieth century, uh, and uh, yeah, and then uh, so they amalgamated in 1909. Their first season was nineteen oh nine, and just to give you an idea, as I said, it, it, nobody should have the impression that they were. Uh, they were a long shot because of the number of things that were going around on in the environment at the time. Uh, but they were runners up. They, they finished second and almost won the championship just before the war. Uh, so, you know, come after the war, they had, they had a pretty strong roster uh, uh, already. In fact, we might see a little bit later. That was one of the reasons why uh, I think a lot of people, uh, or a lot of uh, uh, the hockey authorities, you know, didn't want them to play in the league because they might've been too right. strong. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, given the, well, we know they won the, you know, the Olympic gold, but yeah, exactly. Kind of were right. I mean, <laughs> especially <laughs> some of the teams that they just steamrolled. I mean, I yeah. Think why? Uh, but yeah, also because, and one thing I did want to uh, bring up, and I, we talked about it um, with me and Craig, like you, you saw, you watched that. Uh, it's linked down below for anyone who didn't see that one where we talked to Craig about just hockey's beginnings and then it's connection to the first world war and that kind of thing we talked about like kind of the haphazard way of these leagues and the way things are going i mean you describe at one point like how and i don't want to talk about it tonight because again it's complicated but how like when it, the, the Falcons literally get on the path to represent canada there's teams playing in two different leagues at certain points in eastern yeah. canada at the time which is just like Okay, um, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, I think that's just, you know, indicative of, of this time period and the way hockey was played and yeah. how it was taken. And, and I mean, you do a great job in the book, you know, talking about that whole amateur professional divide mm. that goes on across the pond as well because we got the Brits mm -hmm. watching, even though they should be sleeping, but they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, they live in, one of them lives in France and is 
ragging on the proper football with the actual violence and things like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm going to get in trouble for that one. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, sorry, but there's that divide. And I, I didn't want to get on that too much because I didn't want to focus more on the, on the war stuff. But it, it is sure. an interesting part of the story as well. Yeah. I can't be you know denied that that has an impact on how this develops in, in Canada and the United States and Britain as well. It's, it's very yeah. fascinating. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is other people have seen this. I mean, and you can explain it a little bit, but people love the cat badge. I mean, I've had people oh, come yeah. like online just being like, this is the coolest cat badge ever. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, if you can, you kind of explain the background about Iceland, you know, Icelandic, um, I guess Icelandic Canadians, cause it's several mm -hmm. generations. Right. And kind of what that means, but, explain again because sometimes and i was discussing this with somebody the other day uh, the confusion that is the cef and its organization mm -hmm. <laughs> which again you do a great uh, job of explaining i think one of the best actually i've read that explains oh, it those nice. things succinctly in a good way because i've i've had this issue myself but anyway sorry i'm talking too much so if you no, could uh, ex kind of explain what we're looking at here and what's going on with that yeah, you know, as you pointed out, so when when the war broke out, uh, you know, we, there there was a there's a an ama there was a mobilization plan that was I think it was written in 1911, maybe yeah. revised in 1913, and uh, and and then it kind of got thrown out the window, and uh, and I won't rehash all the points, but you know, the uh, uh, the, the minister of the militia at the time, uh, Hughes, he he kind of said, well, here's what we're going to do, and they started contacting units directly and. And uh, without belaboring the point, the first, conting first Canadian contingent is, is shipped off to Valcarche where they're trained and then they're boarded on their ships and off they go to England for six soggy months uh, or so before they actually uh, move, uh, move into the line. Yeah. Uh, and throughout all that time, the war that was supposed to be over by Christmas, uh, everybody realized it wasn't going to be. Uh, and uh, as over time, the Canadian government increased its commitment uh, to... Uh, uh, to to the war effort and how many troops it's going to contribute and eventually they they land on five hundred thousand men which when you think i think the population was seven or eight million, eight million. It just it's yeah it, absolutely amazing like I, I think i found out it was a third of of all uh, like fighting age males that were in canada at the time i mean again uh, just so to, just to jump in there i wanted to like because yeah. i think sometimes that gets lost particularly mm -hmm to non-Canadians or people who don't know the Canadian story as well and are learning. And I, again, I was just poking a little bit of call in there, but he, he's pretty up on the Canadian stuff, second world war, but like when people are learning and people have told me they're getting interested in this, I think it's just, um, you know, it's, it's so, it's astonishing, honestly, it's, a, it, it's just almost mind blowing that it, it's that many. And it was that many that quickly. They wanted half mm -hmm. a million in the field mm -hmm. within the first two years of the war. Like that is, yeah it was fast like that it was yeah, fast. Certainly. actually as it turned out it was too fast but uh, mm -hmm. anyway. yeah yeah so so to achieve this you know the the first contingent the recruiting went quickly because they, they um uh uh yeah that's funny <laughs> i don't think anybody yeah, specified which christmas <laughs> fair point the uh um <laughs> that must be a lawyer that was saying that <laughs> no it's uh, anyway, I digress. I'm sorry. The uh, uh, where, where was I? The, uh, uh, the the initial contingent was recruited. Recruiting was rather easy, uh, yes. but then they, you know, the government kind of realized that they didn't have the resources to recruit that many people. So they right. they started they uh, they undertook a kind of a public private partnership, and and uh, and all of a sudden there was these recruiting committees uh, set up across the country. Uh, for people who, uh, you, you know, local local businessmen or, or societal leaders, you know, who, who would form a committee and say, we're going to raise a battalion. Uh, so they uh, they would get a committee together, uh, say, hey, let's raise a battalion. And they'd fire off a request to militia department. And uh, somebody in the militia department, probably the minister himself, I don't know, would, would uh, say, right, you're granted a battalion. Off yeah. you go. And uh, and. And that's why I wanted to talk about this because of all, all almost all the Falcons, uh, you know, passed through or belong to yep. the, the 223rd Canadian Scandinavian Overseas Battalion. And of course, these battalions that they were raising were overseas battalions, and it's important, I think, to clarify what that means. Yep. Even though it sounds like they're they're 
they're, they're made for service overseas is actually means we're going to get you overseas. But once you get there, you're going to get folded into, as you mentioned earlier, the battalions of the, of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. So, of course, the, the government, you know, uh, eventually lands on four divisions and a cavalry brigade and the divisional artillery that support it and all the other ancillary troops and whatnot. And uh, so so those units just stayed throughout the war and all the troops came in. But to command, control, administer them, there needed to be some sort of structure. So these overseas battalions were created in Canada uh, and they would recruit and they would, you know, uh, they would have, as you can see, their own cap badges, their own accoutre accoutrement, uh, and they would recruit and train the uh, their soldiers and then uh, off they go. So uh, the 223rd is uh, the battalion that they uh, uh, that the uh, that most of the Falcons served in. There's an interesting story. I don't know if it's in the night on the next slide or this one, but it was there was a bit of drama involved in this uh, as well because. Uh, Oh, no, I can, uh, I'll come back to that in a bit, but uh, you can leave it here. That's go fine too. Go back, go back, go back. We're good. <laughs> okay, We're that's happy. fine. You didn't the, that. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, two, two committees kind of got, came together and said, let's, uh, they, they really, they really uh, appreciate or, or had um, respect for the, the, the Scandinavian stock. So they said, let's, then there's lots of Scandinavians who had settled in, in Western Canada at the time. So these two committees both proposed that they, uh, 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 that they, they raise a Scandinavian battalion. Uh, so both requests went into the minister at the time and, and it came back. Uh, and when, when one of the, uh, one of, one of the committees was, I guess you could say less Scandinavian than the other. And, yeah. uh, yeah, so, uh, and that one was chosen and ended up being the 197th Vikings of Canada battalion. Uh, and its first commanding officer had the, the distinctively non-Scandinavian name of Alfonso Fonseca, and uh, and uh, he was he was a, a bank manager, I think, a, a former vaudeville uh, performer. Mm -hmm. uh, but he but this raised a bit of a hue and a cry uh, amongst the the Scandinavian community in, uh, in not just in Manitoba but throughout Western Canada. So eventually, the minister, uh, the militia department relented, and they uh, they authorized the creation of the 223rd Canadian Scandinavians in February of 1960. Yeah, and I, I just sorry again, again, I keep saying these same points, but I just because the, the so mind blowing is the cast of characters is the only way I can think of even describing most of these mm -hmm. historical <laughs> figures. That's just an example. That's I was reading that. And I'm like, oh, you because you wrote it that way, and I'm like, oh, it's gonna be like I don't know, like you know, like Don Smith or something. And it was like, yeah. I was not expecting that. <laughs> it was just so that was that was out of left field, particularly yeah. for you know Manitoba at the time. Uh, to have a name like that, even in anywhere in Canada, would have been extremely mm -hmm. rare. But again, I think, it, and I think a lot of people know my opinions on who was the minister of defense at the time mm -hmm. and militia sam hughes not a fan i'm not gonna hide it i don't mm -hmm. think he did a good job ever but again it's just that ad hoc politically motivated sam hughes i don't know empire basically mm -hmm. that was just so i think poorly handled and again this is just an example like they're up to 223 battalions and there was more yeah. it's yeah, just that exactly. was way too many like it just it doesn't make mm -hmm. sense but anyway that's just another point i if i can get a sam hughes dig in i will and i did so. <laughs> <laughs> outstanding well yeah maybe we'll throw ross rifle in there somewhere as, oh as yeah oh, okay. another one of my favorites but uh, yeah, so you know, we, they created these overseas battalions with the intent then being they get shipped overseas, they'd arrive in England, and uh, and essentially the battalion they they like get off the ship, get transferred to uh, whatever base they would have normally, you know, Folkestone or, or you know, in the east of England, uh, and then they get folded into these geographically based regiments. So they got folded into the Manitoba Regiment, uh, which uh, and specifically, if I remember correctly, the 18th Reserve Battalion, or no, maybe the 11th Reserve Battalion. 11th. I can't, I can't, yeah, I think so. But, but the Manitoba Regiment had the 11th Reserve Battalion, and I think the 18th and one other, I can't remember all of them. Yeah. Uh, with the intent, those then became feeder units that would send them out into, and they were, they themselves were affiliated with specific battalions uh, mm -hmm. that were actually in the CEF. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the 11th Reserve Battalion had, was responsible for, I think, the 27th City of Winnipeg, the 28th, yeah. and, and maybe something else. Yeah, sorry, just to jump in again, but that is mm -hmm. what I was saying when you wrote it. I'm like, I wish I could have written it like that because it is so confusing. <laughs> you have these overseas mm -hmm. battalions. 
which are actually based in Canada for the majority of their existence. They ship them across the Atlantic. They get to Britain. They're just basically fed in. Well, at the beginning, they were just fed in randomly. They were just broken mm -hmm. off and fed in. And then they made it geographically. So that throws people off. Like you just said, there was a Manitoba regiment. And I'm like, they never fought. That's not their point. Because mm -hmm. people said that and get confused with that. I don't blame them. Then, and yeah, and then they just work their way through this system, but it's all affiliated. And, and it does make sense once you get into it, but it just, mm -hmm. it's so confusing at first because, again, the numbered system is so confusing yeah. because it wasn't the plan. And then yeah. they just went with it. But anyway, so it is, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated thing. And I'm not yeah. claiming to ever make it simplistic because it's, it's just not. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, I wanted to say, yeah, no Colin problem. is not a lawyer. He's a battlefield guide tour, but he said he needed a lawyer a few times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, we're, we're, just we're just poking fun at you, Colin. It's all good. And But Lorelai, who is another re frequent viewer and supporter <laughs> of the channel, actually was a lawyer. So there you go. We we have one in the crowd today. Hey, the, the best man at my wedding was a lawyer, or he is a lawyer. Go. Yeah, so. Yeah. There we go. We're, we've all, we're all connected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you want to keep going? The slides or stay on the slides? uh yeah no we'll, we'll so I, I get we can go to the next slide i think uh so as we, we've been kind of talking you, you know where is it in the and we'll get to a bit more of this in, in the on the next slide after this but yeah. uh whereas the you know the first contingent went to sorry to valcarche yeah. uh and did all the training there they it, which didn't really go terribly well and for a number of reasons and uh but even then you still have to uh admire the logistics of, of what they created uh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. yeah, for the second contingents and beyond and all these overseas battalions, they, the government decided, well, we're just going to leave you in situ. So you get recruited, use some local infrastructure, uh, we'll train you up at one of the local camps, and then we'll ship you out. So so sure enough, all, all these these chaps uh, join these overseas battalions. Uh, and now you have battalions of young men, you know, in uniform getting paid, but kind of milling about, uh, you know, cities and whatnot. Yep. And uh, so the uh, until they were actually shipped off to uh, to actually do their training, so uh, so of course they had to have pastimes and, and sports was was big in the uh, 20, 223rd. And as the picture on the left that you see here is the 223rd Overseas Battalion hockey team. Uh, and uh, I've circled with red there all of the players who would would go on and actually they were members of the Falcons gold medal winning. Uh, 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 team a after the war yep. so it, it, they 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 uh, they joined the team and they actually played so you know the falcons played in the the year previous the uh the 15 16 uh season right. then everybody joined uh and a lot of, and and the local uh, hockey authorities were were really concerned i think you and craig baird talked about this you know they were concerned that there wasn't going to be enough men to play hockey yep. so they said well we'll solve the problem by letting the soldiers play hockey so, uh, so then you have all these leagues that uh, that included these teams like the 61st Battalion, which actually won the Allen Cup, and the 223rd, and and some other uh, some other teams uh, who uh, who played in these leagues. So the they essentially folded the Winnipeg or the Manitoba Amateur Hockey League, and uh, and I can't remember the name of the other one. And they created you know in the season of 1617 the Winnipeg Patriotic League, yeah. which uh, they call it patriotic because there was a couple. Uh, battalion teams in there, but also the um, the money from uh, the gate receipts because this is all amateur. They weren't allowed to make any money for playing right. hockey, so gate receipts, all the money and stuff were, were donated to what would now we would call like soldier on or any kind of support support the troops or uh, a kind of endeavor. And and that was also required because these these recruiting committees uh, they all had to pay for everything themselves. So while the soldiers once they were recruited and they and they had, uh, you know, they were getting their pay. Uh, all the all the, the kind of administrative uh, civilian administration of it that was all out, out of the goodwill of these uh, of these people who formed the committee. So they had their own fundraisers and and whatnot. So uh, yeah, but uh, but this was just to say that you know hockey was never far from their hearts, and they uh, the uh, the the former the former and future Falcons uh, made sure they were still playing hockey even when they uh, climbed or put on the uniform. Yep. And then, like you said, me and Craig talked about that quite extensively and how there was mm -hmm. a professional. Well, they, they weren't, they put it in a professional league, but they weren't professional. It was a mess. Like I said, this is all kind of a mm -hmm. messy time period. Uh, but anyway, that's what we were talking about. Me and Craig led to the impetus of the NHL because 
they yeah. literally went overseas and they had to leave halfway through the season and then that caused the whole ripple effect that went to the yeah. modern day NHL. So it's just again, it's so complicated, so confusing and people who's in control of what? Even the people who are in control don't even know half the time, but they're still playing hockey. So that's why I think this story mm-hmm. is so fascinating to me is no matter what's going on, Canadians are still going to play hockey in <laughs> mm-hmm. any way, shape or form. I mean, it's yeah. It's kind of kind of a thing. For sure. Oh, sorry. We had a quick question, actually. Yeah, uh, I think we covered it a little bit. But Colin's asking, uh, maybe he's talking about the the units specifically. I'm not sure, but I know Folkestone was one of them. I'm not sure what the other major town was for the majority of the war. Sutcliffe, maybe. I can't remember. It was the the two twenty third. Well, the, the Manitoba Regiment and the 11th Reserve Battalion were in Shorncliffe in, uh, in in Folkestone, I think. And I, I read somewhere Upper Dibgate Camp specifically. Yeah, uh, right. I, I don't know exactly where that is. I know it's it's near Folkestone on the east coast, uh, yeah. not far from Dover. I did yeah. a little bit of a map record. I think that. that was the majority. There might, be a slide. there might even be a slide going going forward. Oh, maybe. Uh, I can go look and check. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I, well, that's a good chunk of the, well, the Canadian units were based around that area, as far as I know. Yeah. They weren't really anywhere else, because it didn't really make sense to put them anywhere else. Uh, no, that's Camp Hughes. That's different. Um, yeah. Anyway, maybe we can come back to that if it's in the slides. But anyway, so yeah, that's, sure. uh, they're still playing hockey. Sorry, go on. Go ahead, Dave. No, and that, that's really about it. They But they also played, there was all sorts of other sports leagues, but that's how they, they kept their, uh, uh, you know, c- kind of kept them busy. And then in the summer of uh, in the summer of '16, uh, they uh, they got shipped off to Camp Hughes, which is a good transition to the next slide. There we go. So, so like Valcarce, Camp Hughes was uh, uh, you know a militia camp that was set up uh, to for you know at the time Canada. Well, I shouldn't say as of 1871 or so, uh, Canada started having a permanent or professional military, and you know by the time 1914 rolled around, we did have a, a, a professional military a very small one of course you know at the war they were the first ones out the door uh with the first division uh but the rest the majority of the canadian military you know uh, up until you know, i think even well post-war post-second world war were active militia which means you know army reservists essentially uh so in, in the map you see on the left kind of that that kind of they divided the the country into into military districts and military district ten was the one that encapsulated uh, Manitoba and northwestern Ontario. I think even this might be a bit off. I think at the time of the First World War it included Saskatchewan too, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but nonetheless, yeah. uh, you, you know the uh, just from my personal research, they they used to have camps like north of Winnipeg, uh, and they would fire artillery. You know, if, if anybody's familiar with Winnipeg, there's a there's a penitentiary now in, in uh, near Stony Mountain, and, uh, and it wasn't populated at the time, uh, so they could go off and fire the artillery there. But eventually, Winnipeg got too big, so they established uh, uh, Camp Sewell, which is kind of on the right-hand map, kind of where it's located, and not well de- demarcated. But you can see it's just uh, it's just uh, west of Winnipeg and, and southwest of the uh, of the uh, Manitoba Lakes. Uh, and, and it was created to uh, uh, just specifically for the militia soldiers to uh, uh, to train in. So once with the second contingent and, and follow on forces, they decided they weren't going to centralize them in Valcarce. Suddenly, all these uh, these militia camps that were all over the place became more important. So essentially, all of Western Canada or a big chunk of Western Canada, anyway, the recruits from there fell on uh, on camp on Camp Sewell. Uh, which was renamed at the request of the CPR, uh, Camp Hughes, after your favorite minister of militia. Uh, nice. And it, it was named Camp Hughes in, I think, uh, the, the early months of 1916. At least when, when the when the Falcons and the 223rd arrived there, it was Camp Hughes, I believe. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, so it's located, and it is the... Uh, the precursor so uh, to camp, to CFB Shiloh now. It's yeah. not exactly in the same location. No. You know, at some point, I think in the 30s, they moved the camp to what it, where Shiloh is now. Uh, but Camp Hughes was when they was where they did their training. And yeah. next slide, I'll show you, I think, some of the photos from the place. So in the summer of 16, uh, you know, a number, I've read different numbers, but between 27,000 and 30,000 troops descended on Camp Hughes. Wow. And so... So for a camp that had been built to, you know, maybe train 1.5 or 1,500 or maybe a couple thousand in the summer. 2,000 max. Yeah. yeah, You know, it, uh, 
it, it actually turned into this sprawling uh, uh, camp. Uh, and I, I added the theaters there. there. There were six movie theaters. There was a Midway. There was a, uh, there was the banks set up satellite uh, uh, yep. offices on, on the camp. Uh, and the, the trenches that you see on the top right there, uh, a lot of them are still maybe not in really, really great shape, but Camp yeah, right. Hughes is, is a, a, if you're a World War I uh, uh, enthusiast, you should go to Camp Hughes in Western uh, Manitoba because it still has those trenches laid out and, and you can almost see uh, exactly where the camp was and, and how they trained uh, uh, the, the recruits at the time. So throughout the summer of 16, the 223rd, along with, I, you know, I think, uh, 30 other battalions or something like that were, mm -hmm. were at some point anyway, passed through Camp Hughes to do their training. Uh, at the end of that summer, they got kind of a check, check mark and uh, they spent the rest of the winter in Portage the Prairie. Uh, and then I think it was in January, they got the, uh, they got the word, okay, now you're off. Uh, so I think that would lead us to the next slide where they, uh, they hopped on the train and they, uh, they boarded the SS Justicia uh, in Halifax and off they went. And there it is. The, uh, uh, they, uh, they settled in uh, Folkestone on Canton. Like I said, it was Upper Dibgate Camp, I think is exactly where they were. I think so. uh, and that's where they, and from there they got kind of parceled out to their various units. And uh, those who had been, that had been and would be Falcons went their separate ways. Well, some of them, uh, a couple of them went to the same units, but uh, a lot of them just got spread out through, uh, through a lot of, different units, which I think is where we go next. Yeah. And just to say, just to jump in real quick, that was sure. fairly common um, for the CEF and then for the battalion specifically of the Canadian Corps. It, it didn't really, they obviously, like we said, had these geographic designations and they, they tried to keep it somewhat, again, all of this is all over the place. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'll just make another comment. Um, <laughs> It's distracting me uh, about uh, what was I saying? Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. They tried to keep the geographic designations, but that eventually all fell apart as the Canadian war efforts usually do. <laughs> the, the geographic designations yeah. usually don't hold for much longer, for very long anyway. So anyway, sorry. We'll uh, go on here and talk about the individuals here. Yeah, just a just a, a quick digression. Every all, all the best intentions at the start of the war kind of fell apart, I think. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned I'm in the army. But I didn't. I don't know if I mentioned I'm an artillery officer by trade. Actually, we have, we actually uh, back when we had horses, uh, we had very rigorous um, rules that every battery had to have the same color horse. Uh, so if you were the first senior battery in a regiment, it was chestnut, I think, or maybe black. I can't remember. Uh, yeah. And so they all deployed. They would they would get their horses, but they're like you know wrong color, wrong color, right color. Uh, and then off they go. And, and there was a, a practicality to this because you would then know which horses were belonged to which yeah. battery. Uh, but then they, then they got thrown into the Flemish Maelstrom and, and there was no time for that. So uh, by the that end of the war, the yeah, exactly. It, uh, well, you know, parade ground and pre-war peacetime, of course, but not, not, uh, uh, not at war. Uh, but to re return to this, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of go through the the various Falcons who did serve in the war. So, yep. and I won't read the I won't read the the slide line by line. Everybody who's watching, they could, they could if they want. But it's interesting, you know, he is one of the the three Falcons who this is heavy expert. He was he was kind of a, a coach manager of the team, yep. uh, and uh, but he was one of the three Falcons who joined the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, but you know, at the time there was no Canadian air force. It didn't, it wasn't created till after the war. Uh, so if you were interested in flying, you had to join the Canadian army, you had to get over to England, and then you had to apply through, uh, Canadian Corps headquarters or Canadian expeditionary force headquarters, I think. Uh, and then you had to be accepted into, uh, into the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, so heavy Axford, Herbert heavy Axford, he, he, uh, he was accepted. So he was uh, seconded, uh, or well, he joined the Royal Flying Corps. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he eventually got uh, rose to the rank of acting captain. And he flew the Airco DH-9 long-range uh, bomber. It's amazing how they kept track of these things. Like they, I can't remember where I found it, but they actually had the serial number, like the tail number of his <laughs> airplane. And I'm like, wow, that is pretty amazing. I'm, and not, maybe there honest, I'm, not, I'm not surprised to be honest. Yeah. There, there's these kind of details that get recorded. Uh, yeah. Nothing really surprises me anymore with this stuff. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and for his actions, he uh, he received the Dis distinguished flying cross. He, you know, he was always a, a he was always a leader, uh, 
uh, which is obviously why he was a kind of a coach manager. Uh, yeah. Uh, of uh, uh, of the of the of the Falcons, uh, but uh, and obviously why he performed so well, and he you can see he was promoted to sergeant, uh, you know, months after he enlisted in the in the 223rd Battalion. So obviously they identified his uh, his leadership yeah. skills there. Yeah, you want to keep going? Sure. Yeah, I just saw a comment there about the when the RAF one April uh, April Fool's Day, the uh, Air Force yeah. came into in, in, yeah. came into being. Yeah, and the, and the jokes have been going. I, there's no connection between the two. I know there isn't. Yeah. <laughs> and the jokes have not stopped ever since. Um, yeah, well, yeah, so that, but yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, I just, just want to point out that uh, he he took part in 34 successful bomb raids, which, which is, is, is pretty impressive. Yeah. A lot, <laughs> particularly yeah. from the First World War. That's yeah. a lot, and very much I think deserving of of the uh, of the flying cross. And, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. There's just a lot of individuals and so many stories. You can't do it all. Uh, yeah, I understand. Read. Well, that's why you got to read the book. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Frank Fredrickson was their all-star, uh, their all-star uh, center, uh, yeah. and he, he he was he is going to law school, I think, if I remember correctly, and enlisted in the 196 Western Universities Battalion, which was, uh, you know, only that was that, and I think the. Uh, Highlanders of Queens. I can't remember, but there was a Highland yeah, university or yeah, something like that. Yeah, Highland. but but there was only two overseas battalions that were created with with the names of universities. Even though this Western universities was you know four or five universities, mm -hmm. so a bunch of students had, uh, enrolled in that obviously. But then I think he missed his friends, so he transferred to the twenty two twenty third. He also uh, joined the RFC and uh, yeah, and, and boy from. Icelandic boy from uh, the north end of Winnipeg ends up in Alexandria, Egypt, flying airplanes, and then uh, as a second yep. lieutenant supporting the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. And the taking Absolutely of Jerusalem. Amazing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I say this to people all the time, but I mean, people have these, uh, like I like to say, these kind of, you know, the mind's eye, the popular opinion, the popular idea, Canada, Canadian Corps, Vimy Ridge, Passchendaele, et cetera, et cetera. Like we get everywhere. We're Canadians are everywhere in both world yeah. wars, and this is a perfect example. Like no one would guess, yeah, that some Icelandic boy from the prairies is going to end up supporting yeah. Alan B. taking Jerusalem. You know, it's uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. He he actually he went on to a very successful hockey career afterwards as well. Yeah. Connie, Connie Johansson, uh, good friends with uh, Frank Fredrickson, and uh, like him, they, they they went on parallel. He, he went to uh, Alexandria as well, but uh, yep. whereas uh, Fredrickson went off to support the EEF, uh, uh, Johansson was um, assigned to the Aerial Flying School in, Heli in the Hotel Heliopolis in Heliopolis, Egypt. I'm not sure exactly where that is, uh, but that's he just remained throughout the war as a, as an instructor, a flying instructor. Yeah, so many different paths and so many different yeah. ways of going about this stuff. Uh, yeah, and then, then Bobby Benson, uh, you know, one of the defensemen, he, he, he uh, again, you know, joined 223rd, but he transferred to 27th City of Winnipeg. Uh, so, it's one of the well. I think it's, if I remember correctly, the only actual unit that uh, had City of Winnipeg in its title. I, yeah. uh, I, you know, the the Royal Winnipeg Rifles emerged out of this, but they weren't an actual unit of the CAF, nope. the CEF at the time. No. Uh, Same with the Grenadiers; and, they they weren't, and it wasn't in the name. Yeah. So yeah, he served twenty seventh, and not just him, but uh, the next guy as well. I think also served in the in the twenty seventh. Uh, yeah, Wally Byron. That was their goalie. Uh, he, goalie, yep. Yeah, he uh, he he served with the twenty seventh as well. Uh, both of them got the good conduct badge, but I think I can't remember if it was Wally Byron or, or Connie Johansson. I think it was Wally Byron who he got it. Even though when you go through his personnel record, there he had to forfeit uh, four or five yep. days pay because he was AWOL. So yep. somehow he still got the good conduct he badge. Something good, and I guess some somebody. Yeah. Somebody exactly. wanted to give him a pass on that, I guess, which, yeah, is very strange. But uh. Yeah, he and he was wounded. So we saw that Johansson was wounded in the knee, and, and Wally yeah. Byron was admitted to the 4th Canadian Field Hospital with a contused abdomen. That happened after the war stopped, though. Like, the war ended. This was after the armistice. So 
I'd like to know if he was still around. I'd like to say, what happened? How did you, you get a confused abdomen? <laughs> what were you yeah. doing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, who knows? I can only speculate, but I know. Yeah, maybe they were playing or, hockey. Or, uh, probably playing. Well, I was going to say either hockey. that or I'm assuming alcohol and fighting was involved. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, that could be too. There a lot of that players. in the D mob period, uh, yeah. especially in the First World War. A lot no, of fighting. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. And a few murders too. Oh, more than a few. Yeah. <laughs> Riots, everything. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, exactly. maybe that could be another show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> demob violence. Sorry, demobilization is demob. Yeah, and then this, of course, is the is the loss that I alluded to. Yeah, it, exactly. So if anybody's you know seen the heritage, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, they they really they, they kind of highlight the fact that uh, uh, you know two of the Falcons were lost. So. Frank Thorsonson was one. He was born in Selkirk uh, in November 1994. Uh, again, I won't re read all through this, uh, yeah. but he actually ended up in in, uh, in Swift Current, uh, and so he didn't actually join the 223rd, even though he he was from Winnipeg and, and he played uh, yeah. he played with the Falcons before the war. Uh, he got transferred. To, he, he ended up in D, D or sorry D Company of 10th Battalion. Uh, fought through a few things. Uh, and then, uh, you know, on the 12th of March, 1908, he was part of an eight-man raid. So I just wanted to mention here, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, uh, like, uh, World War One tactics, but by throughout the war, raiding was so important. It was one of the ways you, you captured prisoners to get information. You, you kind of, uh, you defined the layout of the, uh, of the enemy trenches. So raids happened a lot. And, uh, and whenever they went off, you know, often the, uh, whether it was a raid against the Canadians or a, a Canadian raid or an allied raid against Germans, yep. uh, you know, there was always the SOS flares that went up with artillery fire. So in this case, he was, uh, 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 the Germans retaliated with some gas shells, uh, which, which obviously affected him. And uh, he was evacuated at the first Canadian clearance station in Barlin and then, he it took uh, he sadly passed away six days later. Uh, so you know th there are re different reports whether he he died on the 14th or the 20th. I I think so. I can't remember what data I put in the next one, but uh, uh, or sorry, not the 14th, uh, the 14th or the 18th. Uh, but but I, I think it was on the 18th. At any rate, the uh, he succumbed to the effects of the gas and, and sadly uh, passed away. Yeah, and, and this is just one thing. I wanted from from when I was reading your book because you specifically mentioned like the German the spring offensives right which most mm -hmm. people are I think are fairly aware of because they're massive offensives yeah. trying to you know divide the British and French armies and, and basically trying to do what the Germans did in 1940. Uh, anyway, but the Canadian Corps wasn't really touched, so people tend to assume it was very very quiet. Whereas in the case like you bring up, the raids are constant. Right. They, they mm -hmm. have to keep pushing, putting, sorry, pressure on the Germans because of what's happening. So I think it's it's worth noting. Again, we're talking about the hockey story here, but Canadians are we're still dying, still getting wounded at this time period. It's not mm -hmm. by any means just sitting around in a trench waiting for the Germans to do something. Yeah. Yeah, this is it here, which I just very briefly talked about. But yeah, we're we're getting closer to we're over the almost the hour, so we'll keep moving. But uh, oh yeah, yeah. So as you work with that, yeah, yeah, and uh, spared the spared the the bulk of it, but but not everybody, which leads us to the our, our last chap who, yeah. who sadly gave up his life. So um, yeah, George Ernest Cumbers, you know, he played rovers or sorry cover point for the Falcons before the war, uh, and uh, you know at, at that point in the war there was um, a lot of. Uh, you know, if you weren't fight, fighting on the front lines in the, in the actual uh, uh, infantry battalions, the, the support network was huge. Uh, and if you had any kind of railway skill, by this point, they were they were installing light uh, railway uh, lines to bring ammunition to the front. So there were these light railway lines all throughout Europe uh, that connecting with the major railway lines. So he because he had worked uh, uh, for the railway, they, they put him in uh, started his Canadian Railway Troops number two section, skilled railway employees. So that's a bit of a mouthful for a unit. Yeah, a little bit. And then, <laughs> yeah. Then it was renamed the number 13 Canadian Light Railway Operating Company. Uh, so, you know, after uh, a week after Michael launched, they were in the rough area, but th this was all part of the battle that was going on. Again, they weren't directly in the line of fire, but there was, you know, still lots of activity in their in their sector. Uh, and one shell uh, landed right in the middle of Cumbers camp, 24 killed, 26 wounded as well. And sadly, uh, Cumbers was one of them who uh, who was killed in the in the burst. So, uh, yeah, he he died. Uh, it was and so here and. 
this is on the 28th and you know whether it's the 18th or the 20th Thorstenson died eight days so a week maybe maybe two at the most yep. uh before him and here they had played hockey together uh this chap went off to Montreal Thorstenson went to Swift Current they enrolled in different units uh and and within the space of close to two weeks they were killed uh these were these these were chaps who, who played hockey together you know before the war uh and if we go to the next slide, you know, um, they, they were, uh, yeah. they're both buried at Barland communal cemetery. Uh, and, and I guess the slide after this, even <laughs> there's, there's literally, I think, um, nine headstones. Yeah. Something like, I think you said eight or nine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah. well, 37, 28. So yeah, yeah. nine. So, you, you know, just in, if you visited these, uh, the, that's not a long distance. So here are you know chums who who uh, played hockey together uh, two two very different trajectories to get to where they got and now they're uh, they're they're reposing in uh, in France's soil there uh, not far from one another so it's 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 very it's sad to think about you know well all of the everybody everybody who was killed all the, the young lads who were, who were cut down in the prime of life uh, you know in Canada sixty thousand and uh, and throughout the other well on all sides it's it's absolutely horrible uh, but uh, these kind of uh, uh, these coincidences if you want to call it that are, are that they're so close is uh, it's just uh, you know very interesting and, yeah it's in it's just again it's almost like it's mind boggling in a, in a sense because and again this I think this happens quite frequently with Canadians particularly in the first world war is is this yeah i guess that's what i said is a coincidence that these things happen obviously there's reasons why but it just it mm -hmm. seems so coincidental sorry and when when i read this part the, uh, i couldn't stop my brain but from you know how the, the first casualty or the first killed of the you know of the bef british expeditionary force at mons is in the same cemetery as the last you know british empire canadian yeah. killed in the war i just could not not make that connection mm -hmm. but it's just how these things work out who is where and when and how all this comes together it's just you would not guess this you know mm -hmm. to you know teammates who play hockey and then went you know literally opposite directions of winnipeg when you know one went further west one went east yeah. and then somehow they end up horribly together again it's just it's i guess that's why i like doing history because it's just these yeah. stories that always seem to happen <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, and that's that five, personal, a little two cents on that. Yeah, yeah, and it's that personal connection. It's not just uh, oh, these are these are two of sixty thousand. Like we have a name, we have a history, we have a connection. Yep. It's uh, it, it personalizes the story. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Anyway. Yeah. So you already talked about demo, but I don't want to. They all they well, except for the, the those two, they made it home uh, okay. Uh, you'll have to buy the book if you want to read about their their post-war drive to the Olympic gold in uh, mm -hmm. the on the ice in Antwerp in 1920. Uh, but suffice to say, you know, I think we let the, uh, the the secret out that they won. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. so when they when they came back, um, you know, when they came back after the after the Olympic tournament, uh, there was all sorts of celebrations. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the one that they you know that that kind of stood out uh, to me is. And here it is, uh, you know, the, the 223rd was disbanded in 1917 or, or yeah, 1917 when they arrived mm -hmm. in, um, in England. But uh, there was a 223rd reunion when they got back from right. Uh, right. when they got back from the Olympic that, uh, to celebrate them winning the, uh, the, the gold medal. So, yeah, it's uh, th th even though they didn't serve for that unit in combat, you know, there was obviously that connection uh, from uh, from when they joined. Well, yeah, and and one thing I do wanted to just touch on briefly, if that's okay, because this is another mm -hmm. part of the important part of the book. But and you alluded to it earlier, is the things that happened in Winnipeg after the war. I mean, like you mentioned already, you have this brutal war was sixty six thousand Canadians are killed. Mm -hmm. um, then you have the well. I, I gotta stop calling it the Spanish flu because it yeah. wasn't Spanish. <laughs> you know the yeah. influenza outbreak in 1918, yeah. and that rips through Canada just like everywhere else. But and then you have the the general strike, which, as some of you don't might not know, there was lots of labor tension because I, I actually wrote a peer review article on labor yeah. Canadian labor in the First World War. Not really my specialty, mm -hmm. but I really did enjoy writing it. Um, there was just lots of labor strife, particularly in Winnipeg. Yeah. And it led to full of rioting. And like there's mm -hmm. famous photos of this, like there's a streetcar on fire. 
which is used mm -hmm. all the time when the, the, the strike is talked about. Um, but I think, and you bring up a good point, is the, the victory in the Olympics, again, sorry, spoiler alert, uh, is used as kind of this coalescing event to bring some sort of unity back or mm -hmm. to create a unity. I don't even say back because there really wasn't any unity before the war, but some sort well, of you know community spirit, I guess. I don't know if that's even the right word, but. No, I, I, I think that would be the right word. You know, they've been through so many hardships. Uh, you know, it was something it was something for Winnipeg to celebrate. And you know, yeah. it was always, always maligned. But not only, you know, the one thing I'll, I'll also add very, very quickly, uh, they uh, they, you know, Winnipeg was a booming town. It was meant to be the Chicago of, uh, yep. of Canada right. uh, until about 1913. So there was a bit of a, a crash. Uh, and then you know, then the war hit. Then, then the influenza. Then the then the uh, the labor unrest, uh, and the building of the Panama Canal didn't help either, because uh, once the, the Panama Canal was built, and it's by no means exclusively the reason for kind of uh, uh, Winnipeg going from boom to to near bust, if not outright bust, uh, but it became a lot uh, cheaper to ship things through the Panama Canal uh, instead of over the train. And because of the, where the border is and where the lakes are, you had to go through Winnipeg. That's where the, tr the, the train line went through. So Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's the story of Canada becoming a confederate. Well, it's confederation, right, is, is the train. Yeah, so, anyway. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we have any questions that I missed. If anybody has any questions, I think now is a good time. Um, I don't think I missed anything. We just had uh, Colin's question about the... Um, the location was in England, which we had the map, which has yeah, Southeast England, mm -hmm. which makes sense because the channel's right there. And you know, these guys are meant to go to France. They're not just to hang out in England. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so again, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Scott is, uh, is uh, got a bit of an American chip on his shoulder <laughs> about the Panama Canal. Yeah, you guys always doing something to us every time. Every time. <laughs> There's another Canadian pastime, blaming the Americans for something. Hmm. <laughs> something we always do. Um, uh, oh, actually, this is a really good question, if you don't mind, if we just take a few more minutes to talk yeah, about Of course. This. Did they play outside? I'm not sure no. in certain cases. I'm not sure. No, I I, I, I don't think that, like, the uh, certainly when the uh, – I'm sure there, there were outdoor skating rinks in Winnipeg, so, yeah, I, I'm sure at some point they played outside. However – uh, in their drive to the uh, to the Olympics after the war, uh, they 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 all played in uh, uh, in arenas, and even even in Antwerp, uh, they, yeah. they played in in the what it was called the Ice Palace, uh, yeah. and uh, but it, it was square and it had odd odd dimensions, but uh, uh, they nonetheless played it. So it was it was played inside. Yeah, it's just because again, the not, not part I don't want to talk about too too much is, but not necessarily it wasn't necessarily the, the, the Falcons' journey, but the because you talk about all the other teams too that they because this is literally it was a national competition, right? To to get yeah. to that point, so it's just there's a lot of teams involved in very small towns, but again, things are are booming and Canadians are going out of their way to play hockey mm -hmm. and to support it. So and arenas are part of that. I mean, arenas are still part of the fabric of pretty much every Canadian town. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm being over. No, uh, no, over, no. You know, I don't think I'm exaggerating really, to be honest. I always, I always make a joke um, when I'm with uh, friends and we're going somewhere like every, every Ontario town has either a beer store, has always a beer store, uh, LCBO. So the liquor store and an arena yeah. and a Tim yeah. Hortons. <laughs> Uh, the rest is all kind of optional, but those four are usually, or it's usually a beer store or LCBO combo, so you can get a three for it. Yeah. Uh, but it, those are the three. There's always an arena. The town could be a thousand people, and there's an arena. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's usually the biggest <laughs> building in the town by far. So I think it's yeah. just, this is kind of the start of this. And again, like me and Craig talked about for quite extensively, is just the, the, the fabric, like the role that hockey has in this country. Mm -hmm. and how the stories like the Falcons are very well known, I think, in Canada and getting better. Oh, and I, I forgot to say earlier, I'll post the uh, Heritage Minute in the video after because I, I do. It's, it's quite it's a quite a stirring um, Heritage Minute. It got me. I was watching it earlier today. I got the goosebumps mm -hmm. going a little bit, even though I know completely everything that was about to happen. <laughs> but like you said, even though it's got uh, Letter Kenny in it. Oh, I love Letter Kenny. Yeah. Love that show. <laughs> oh, hey, yeah, that's a yeah. Southern Ontario show. So yeah, no, it, I, it is good. It is. Yeah. I grew up with people, but it's got. That, you, 
anyway, sorry. Yeah, it's got Jared Kiso in it, who is yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. And Letter Kenny and creator of Letter Kenny, which is booming all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so yeah, it's uh, uh, where was I going with that? I forget. Oh yeah, the Heritage Minute. I'll post that down below. Mm -hmm. I, tw I tweeted it earlier. You can go check it out there too, uh, if you want to see it. For those of you who haven't, uh, but again, they focus on the loss of the two, which I think is is fair. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure. Again, I don't know. If, actually, here's a question, if you don't mind. Did mm -hmm. any of these players leave writings at all in any kind of shape or form or anything like that? And how they felt yeah. about all of this? Yeah. Um, the, the only kind of reference I found, and not a good one, was. Uh, well, I mean, it's good. I just didn't get a lot of access to it. it was Connie Johansson wrote a wrote a diary, and there was mm -hmm. a couple scanned pages somewhere I, I seem to recall that I found online, uh, but um, I, I I wasn't able to find actually get a, get a hold of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe so. Uh, yeah, most of my my resources are actually uh, you know newspaper clippings. Yeah. Uh, so newspaper archive is just an absolute yeah. and, and the number of Manitoba newspapers that have been scanned, I, I, it's just a treasure trove. If you're into oh, yeah. Manitoba history, oh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, it's it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, there's a lot, and uh, yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great thing. Well, back then too, there was just so many more newspapers. Yeah. Uh, every time, again, every tiny little town had one, uh, and yeah. usually multiple. Uh, uh, anyway, so one final question I did want to ask: Is there anything now that you've got this? Okay, or anything else history related coming from you or anything you want to do or uh, so i'm you know, i've always got uh, several projects on the go which is probably why i almost never finish them I, you know I, I really i'm kind of a squirrel i get distracted pretty easily but i hear that i think the one i'm, I'm <laughs> devoting my most attention now to is as i mentioned i'm an artillery officer and i'm, I'm fascinated with the, the history of, of the artillery uh, is I'm hoping to, uh, I'm working on a project that will kind of explore uh, the, the technical, it'll be a historical, technical, tactical uh, survey of, uh, of uh, artillery during the, of Canadian artillery, specific, specifically during uh, the First World War up until Vimy Ridge and how the development mm. of uh, tactics, techniques, equipment, the, the yep. entire uh, the core the artillery that supported the Canadian Corps how it became what it was during the assault on Vimy Ridge so stay tuned you know that might uh, I've been working on that though for uh, almost five years so who knows how much longer it might be another five years till I get <laughs> yeah it. I, I get that I mean I've got things that I yeah I had I had I had aspirations to to publish it at the, the same time as the 100th anniversary in 2017 and you can see that it's uh, just missed it by that, <laughs> that much went. yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> just that much uh but anyway well, you did you wrote a, a great article again that's completely unrelated well, no war canadian military history good enough mm -hmm. uh about the, the artillery for veritable operation veritable which is is amazing because mm. you don't most people are like what is operation veritable right it's the clearing yeah. of the island so mm -hmm. i mean just that's a perfect example of the stuff that you do because like again when i wasn't trying to be cheeky or anything but uh, at the beginning you just you do so much and uh, i mean i just I admire it that you're able to accomplish all of these things and then still write a book about hockey and a hockey team and it's just it's, it's amazing and again uh Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the kind words. And I want to say thanks to you for what you do. You know, this well, obviously you. with the people following here, uh, obviously love what you're doing and it's very important. And, uh, and, and, you know, I think you, this is the first time we talk face to face, even though it's virtual, uh, yeah. but we exchanged a lot of Twitter, uh, yeah. 128 characters of, uh, of self congratulatory yes, messages or whatnot. But, you know, I was really touched when you, you met, went out of your way to go to the war memorial the other day and film it. You know, I think mm. we were all we were all kind of, uh, um, you know, certainly certainly negatively affected by what we saw happen during the uh, mm -hmm. uh, occupation protest, whatever we want to call it at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, small world, it, that, that video that kind of went viral that uh, uh, was filmed of the, the woman jumping up on the, the tomb of the dead soldier is uh, my neighbor here, actually, he, he only lives two doors down in my condo here. He actually filmed it. So Commodore oh, wow. Steve Thornton is his name. Yeah, and he, so, uh, you know, we were lucky he was there. I, mm -hmm. we, I just had, we just happened to go over to his place for, uh, for an adult beverage, uh, I think the day after. And I said, what, why were you even there? And, uh, and he, he said, uh, you know, for that very reason, they wanted to, they wanted to make sure that things weren't going awry at the uh, at the war memorial, and, and sadly, they, they they found evidence that it was. But you know, it's important that you you went back there, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, I 
just down the street, there's a the National Aboriginal yep. uh, Veterans uh, Memorial as well. And uh, some local First Nations uh, are sometime in the future, from what I understand, going to hold a cleansing ceremony there be, because of some of the uh, uh, you know, so, some of the things that happened around that as well. So, yeah, which uh, is greatly appreciated by the community uh, and tons yeah, of people are mm -hmm. in support of that. I am. I mean, I, I was trying to because I was talking to people, I was talking to my parents who don't live here and other mm -hmm. people. And I'm like, because and some people were even putting comments when I was taking because I take pictures and I always stop at the the Aboriginal Memorial as well um, mm -hmm. because it just I I feel it's do respect um as, mm -hmm. as so many other people uh but anyway sorry just the uh, people like it's peaceful looking I'm like yeah but the energy is still off it just didn't feel yeah. right um and i don't want to talk about this too much because i've already gotten kind of a little bit of trouble about saying some things but <laughs> some people mm -hmm. are giving me some trouble about the whole thing that happened but yeah. uh, it just it just felt off uh, and i'm wanting to get back to the respect and you know what it is due at these places and i'm glad that the oh, local for sure group are going to help us get back and yeah. that I am greatly uh, appreciative for and for you for telling mm -hmm. me that because I, I heard that that was going to happen I just didn't know what if it was moving forward and and, and it sounds like it is so uh that's mm -hmm. great and there's a good positive end to the show <laughs> I think that's a good yeah I think I, I will end with a bit of a table bomb though just uh, uh I, I watched your show with Craig Baird uh about hockey and it was fascinating uh, I only flew into a into a Yosemite Sam style rage uh, when uh, at one point, and and it's important to bring it up here because I think towards the end he was asked a question about uh, how did the Russians become so good, uh, right. and and his answer, you know, kind of you know, is, is a great answer, uh, but he he at one point kind of said, well, here's how you know for so, so many times uh, uh, the uh, Can well Canadians dominated. Uh, international hockey, and then he said, for, right from 1924 to 1952 <laughs> or 56, or whatever the case might be. And I'm like, no, it was 1920, and and that's one of the problems. <laughs> and, and and I kind of referred to that in the conclusion of my book is that the 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 and one of the I should have started this up, uh, up front. One of the reasons <laughs> I wrote this book is because there's there's still even among intelligent, learned people think because the that the first olympic gold medal was issued in 1924 because i think that was the first winter games uh, uh maybe uh, but uh so uh so I was like, no it was 1920 <laughs> okay uh, we can yell so, later yeah, exactly we'll, we'll so yell at, well, that's why i don't say these things because that way i can't get yelled at if i don't say anything yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll yell at craig later um yeah he can take it uh but okay. uh, yeah <laughs> no that's, that's a good point it's, it's a valid point too because it's just mm -hmm. Not how it went down. Uh, but uh, yeah. anyway, so I'm just going to do a quick sign off and we'll come we'll come back and we'll say goodbye together. All right. Sounds good. So thanks everyone for watching. I uh, really appreciate everyone sticking through. Um, this is a great show. Great to have Dave on talking about this book. Like I said, I really enjoyed it. Go check it out uh, on Amazon uh, and, and go get it. Uh, I'll say it again. Just go get it. It's great. It, it combines so many different things that don't often get connected, but are part of all of this story of pretty much post Canada and the, right after the war and first world war and how this was such an influential conflict on Canada today. Uh, and this is another lens to look at it. And I highly suggest you go and, and go do it. Uh, so what's going to come up next, I'm not going to do anything for the next quite a while. Um, back to some more crazy times again, like I've had uh, lately. Those are coming back on me, unfortunately. Uh, but I am planning on doing something with Alex Black and the Juno Beach Center um, coming up. We have it tentatively scheduled, and there'll be more details coming up uh, shortly. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, and also, as always, check out the Patreon page. Every Patreon I get, I think I'm at 44, no, 43, 44 uh, as of today. So it's great to have the support. Uh, check that out. And you can also support the channel and my work through Buy Me a Coffee and, um, and PayPal too. Uh, and, and also, as always, please subscribe and like the video and then leave comments down below afterwards. Um, that always helps the video get seen by more and more people, which is what I need uh, to keep the channel growing and, and keep things going. So if you can do that, that'd be greatly appreciated. So thanks again, Dave. Uh, appreciate it. And my pleasure. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate all the kind words. Uh, kind of good boost for the uh, end of the day here for me. So, nice. so, uh, so yeah. So what I'll say, uh, so like I said, uh, thanks again, everyone, for watching. And I'll see you sometime in the future. I'll keep everyone uh, as updated as I can moving forward. So I'll see everybody later. Bye, everybody.